Okay, the final speaker is a colleague at the University of California, and he's at Berkeley, uh, Shankar Sastri. Hello, Shankar. And I think we have uh, Larry Rohrber. Rohrbo. Is that, did I pronounce that correctly? So Shankar is the director of the Richard C. Bloom Center for Developing Eco Economies and professor of electrical engineering and computer science. Go ahead, Shankar. Terrific. Thank you very much, Teresa. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's see. I thought I'd shared my screen, but uh, uh, okay. All right. Is the uh, screen visible and am I audible? Yes. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Conval. Uh, you know, I want to talk about a SDC. It's a science and technology center that I had the privilege of uh, leading from 2007 to 2000, 2006 to 2017. It was called uh, TRUST, the Team for Research in Ubiquitous Secure Technology. So it's cybersecurity. The partners were uh, uh, Cornell, Carnegie Mellon, Vanderbilt, um, uh, Stanford and San Jose State, was actually class of 2005. Uh, and, uh, you know, the center has since ended. Let me, let me just sort of tell you what we did. And, you know, we, uh, I've been at DARPA in, uh, in the early 2000s, and then that's when cybersecurity and there were attacks, the so-called uh, AOL attacks. And, uh, uh, and, you know, there was a sense that we were falling behind and in all aspects of cybersecurity. So, and we realized that it was certainly a question of new technologies, but also uh, economics and of course, privacy policy and law. And so we thought it was important to put this together. And shortly after the center began, President Obama highlighted in a series of uh, presidential directives the immediate the need for actually building a strong workforce across all aspects of society and that very much shaped our uh, our our ethos in the programs i'm going to talk about you know there's a shorter version of a longer presentation that we had on the impact of the center but i'll do my best to give you sort of a snapshot in 20 minutes and you know uh, not unlike the ERCs in the SDCs, you know, the SDCs are supposed to be a little more upstream than the ERCs, but of course there's considerable overlap in the mission. It's really a tight integration of the research, which the education and the outreach and the knowledge transfer certainly to industry, but also to government agencies. And let me just, uh, you know, there are a number of the logos here, both on the left and the right, but let me sort of concentrate on that middle pillar. You know, early in the SDC process, you know, NSF really encouraged us to embark on a, a strategic planning process about where you'd make an impact. And I was fortunate to have as my chief scientist, uh, Fred Schneider at, uh, at Cornell. And Fred and I, we took the DARPA model of, uh, what are called ISAT studies to heart and the entire team, you know, it was 30 odd professors and the initial cohort of 90 students and so on. We embarked on a set of studies and we thought it was important to coalesce, not just on cybersecurity, but on what cybersecurity would do in three important infrastructures. One was financial infrastructures, second was healthcare infrastructures, this was the time that personal medical records and uh, also patient portals were very much just popping up. And so electronic health systems were popping up. And finally, physical infrastructures. This included distributed monitoring, the growth of IoT, uh, and advanced uh, monitoring of physical networks, be they in transportation or in energy. So I'll lead you through these three pillars. And uh, the problems were slightly different in those different pillars. You know, when we started, you know, all these kinds of phishing attacks 
fishing, spear fishing, all of which are now pretty common. And they continue to be, they continue to plague us. But, you know, we really started thinking about the scientific underpinnings of what it would take to build trustworthy environments that allowed financial institutions, online retailers, and customers to be able to transact. And the challenges are the systems are not in control of one organization, and they involve both people and computers. And, uh, you know, we really took to heart to uh, this bank robber, Willie Sutton, who said that this is probably really important because that's where the money was. So, you, you know, I, I think that we really did a huge amount, all of which is now built in to every browser that you use into the kind of password authentication with pictures and so on and so forth. They're all very much now built in for the authentication of the client to the site, even the lock on the uh, on the websites, this came out of our research. And, it, uh, and uh, you know, so this, I think, was a big success. The second one was on healthcare infrastructures. And we were fortunate at the time that the Vanderbilt Medical School was just launching a patient medical portal called My Health. And the issues there were about how do you encode uh, privacy modeling, HIPAA, COPPA, other standards into those frameworks. And one of the first things you got to do is to take law and convert it into formal specifications. And my colleague, uh, John Mitchell at Stanford, the first thing he showed was HIPAA and COPPA were logically incorrect in that there were mutual contradictions in the legislation. So the first, uh, the first thing we had to do was to fix up HIPAA and COPPA uh, with the support of FDCs, FCCs, you know, all of them were involved in the effort to make them logically correct before they were embedded. And the questions you can imagine that arise in this is about relatives, friends, who is entitled to what access. And the test bed we had was what was going live at uh, Vanderbilt, which was the My Health test bed. The last piece is really the one that has grown in tremendous importance. It's about IoT. And, you know, at the time the smart grid was coming in, but one of the biggest vulnerabilities even today is about the so-called SCADA networks. They control our energy infrastructure, our transportation infrastructure, water infrastructure. We actually, as part of this, with a former PhD student of mine called Saurabh, we attacked uh, water networks in the center of France and with the, America, with the Army Corps of Engineers. We attacked the water locks to be able to determine best practices for the management of locks in on the Mississippi, and uh, you know, and also electrical grid infrastructures, and you know, smart meters. All of those. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the kinds of changes that we make. So the research included within it certainly sort of core computer science, but even there, the kind of research that we saw in the average cybersecurity conferences was sort of reactive in the sense it was today's attacks, tomorrow's science, and day after tomorrow's solutions. So we began a, a project of really developing a science of security. And in fact, uh, the companies had been pressing for this and the NSA actually really took this to heart and they championed the develop, our development in the center of a science of security, which has the uh, somewhat uh, surprising acronym of SOS. And to today, if you look at the NSA's uh, uh, lablet structure and also inside the research component, SOS is deeply embedded in that ethos. It's supposed to be not reactive, but proactive. And that's the kind of research. The other part of it was about complex interdependency modeling, you know, how uh, the power infrastructure impacts the healthcare infrastructure, impacts the financial infrastructure, and how do you model it? And how do you then figure out whether cyber insurance is a possibility? You know, there had been theorems in economics, somewhat a theorem due to Ken Arrow, uh, the Nobel laureate from Stanford, which said it was impossible to have certain kinds of cyber insurance. But, you know, uh, Lloyd's and uh, all the universities now have uh, 
have to have uh, insurance against attack and how do you design these? These are the kinds of questions that we addressed. So, you know, they, are, they have policy law. We had a, we had a chief uh, policy officer, Deirdre Mulligan. She was also, she had the same title at Microsoft. She was also a big advisor to the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. And that was a huge part of it. And the second part of it was about the human computer interfaces. You know, your security is only as usable as it is you make it useful. Otherwise, like all of us, you know, when we get large security policies, we tend to do tick, tick, tick and scroll to the next page. And so we have to make it understandable. So all of that was sort of what went into it. Here are some examples. We pioneered an effort called do not track. And this is the idea that when you click on ads, supposing you click on an ad in a newspaper and it's on the it's for one company. The question is, do other companies get to know what you're clicking on and do they, can they use this? And that, uh, it was important for us to provide guarantees that there was, uh, that browsers in this particular case, Google was not, uh, was not using it to track, uh, to, to, to track users and we produced this, which is now built into all major browsers into Google, Bing, or just about any browser, Safari, anything you can think about. And in fact, uh, during the course of this, there was a huge Wall Street Journal article. That's the third item down this with Ashkan Sultani, where uh, you know, it was sort of a big deal that Google had not responded yet. And we, we got them to, the, and finally on with pressure from the W3C, that's the World Wide Web Consortium, we managed to get all the browser windows to buy into this. Other items that we did is about census. You know, how do you take a look at how, how well we are doing in privacy? This is certainly a big issue now. Our colleagues in the law school came up with this measurement of how well we are doing on privacy. Privacy, as you may know, is not absolute. And, uh, you know, this notion of utility-based privacy, you, know, you tell a doctor, all kinds of things in the expectation of service, but you don't want them to track you. And so this question of how you do this, how you measure this is now built into a number of economic models. And finally, on the smart grid privacy, here too, you know, the issues were that if you can spoof, if, when we started this project, utilities were not encoding smart meter data. So we found, uh, working with law enforcement in Los Angeles, that uh, mafia, mafia groups were getting a hold of smart meter data and disaggregating it, which means it's a technical term, which is you know from the smart meter data, you figure on which appliances are on inside the house and so on and so forth. And you use this disaggregation to determine the level of occupancy of a household and the mafia groups were actually using it to target break-ins of homes that were not occupied. And so the very first thing we managed to succeed in doing is to get out all these utility companies to encode the data. So I still put in one level of protection, but more generally to try to provide greater uh, privacy protections in, and you know, if disaggregation sounds like a privacy nightmare, there are really substantial concerns uh, that we addressed in this work. So as a result of this, there was there during the course of the center, there was a huge amount of interest. Uh, this is the DOD and especially the Air Force. You know, the Air Force had its electronics, uh, his big IT base at Rome, New York, literally uh, uh, 1,500, 1,200 miles away from Ithaca. And they started off a parallel effort called AF Trust. And then uh, the, uh, the Hewlett Foundation started off a center for long-term cybersecurity to address policy implications. Tom Siebel, and this is private philosophy, his private foundation started off a project in uh, you know, the cybersecurity of, uh, and these are all big, big ticket items. Intel launched a uh, project called Scrub to piggyback on our projects. There was a follow-up NSF here, and then uh, HHS, uh, Health and Human Services, jumped in on the work that we had begun on uh, cybersecurity of uh, healthcare records, and they launched a 
a new partnership called SHARPS, which was Strategic Healthcare and IT. And then two large international partnerships, you know, it caught me and I'll, uh, I'll highlight ICAST in a second, but PCARI, which is the Philippine California Advanced Research Institute, uh, uh, a benefactor of Cal called Dado Banatao convinced the then president of the Philippines, Aquino Benin on the third, to start a program of collaboration in cybersecurity between a coalition of about 18 Philippine universities and initially a set of California institutions, but certainly all the trust partners as well, where there were really large sums of money both sent to the US institutions and also to the Philippine institutions, both public and private, to be able to participate in cybersecurity drills, which involved uh, you know, the water infrastructure, the power infrastructure, uh, and uh, so, you know, that's uh, one of the partnerships. Let me talk about ICAST. Uh, that's this next slide. This is the partnership with Taiwan. So the State Department actually gave us uh, special permission to work with a coalition of the uh, Academia Seneca, which is the National Academy of Taiwan, uh, National Academy of Science and Technology in Taiwan, TWISC, which is an industry group, and uh, the and also another co industry coalition called Triple I, which is the three uh, three bars on the right, to put together and these university NTU, SD, NTU, all of these. Let me not read you through all the acronyms there. Uh, on really working on cybersecurity and for our American researchers here, this was a total godsend. This program continues to this day. Uh, also with the support of the State Department. And, you know, for the forensics in terms of the cross straits attacks, it's an incredibly rich source of traces for our, uh, our secure cybersecurity researchers. And the big contribution here is uh, a colleague of mine, Vern Paxson, who makes the world's most uh, commonly used intrusion detection system called BRO. Uh, BRO, by the way, came out of trust and BRO is open source, it's available. Let me keep going. Uh, a whole boatload, you know, we have on the larger version of the report, a number of companies, but here are some of the big, uh, not only startups, but then the liquidity events where, uh, you know, I can promise you that we made a lot of our students and a lot of our faculty substantial monies from these uh, transitions. Uh, Coverity was bought by Synopsys, and Saita and Don Song's company was bought by FireEye and Fortify was bought by HP and so on and so forth. These are all really quite good. And so, you know, it was important. And, uh, you know, the, the DOD had really been struggling with a lot of these issues. And the NSA, of course, had the lead, but certainly uh, the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, they all sort of piggybacked on what we could do for them. And to this day, uh, they work with us on what are known as APTs, which are Advanced Persistent Threats. Uh, in terms of test beds, you know, we made available a cybersecurity test bed, emulator test bed called DETER, uh, joint with USC. And those were used by all the telecom companies and in fact, by the DHS to do what are called cyber storm drills, where they would emulate uh, we, uh, large parts of the internet, you know, we could emulate a 164 scale model of the, in the entire worldwide internet on deter. And those are the kinds of test beds that we made available. Let me talk a little bit about uh, community building and so this is a little bit more about the standards bodies, you know, it was really critical to work with agencies in Washington, agencies with uh, worldwide standards, you know, really, uh, is uh, this uh, former UUC president. She was then the Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano. She was instrumental in getting DHS to pay attention to what we were doing in trust, of course. They were anyhow, they partnered with us on the cybersecurity test bed anyhow. The courses, they're not only, we, we depository all these courses in Trust Academy online and there's some the bulk of them have found their way onto Coursera and some into uh, edX as well. But uh, there have also been professional masters, online masters, all running with large numbers of students every year. But let me talk about education and training. So we focused on 
a few, you know, after President Obama in 2009 talked about workforce, we really took to heart the need to really educate the workforce. And we had an annual event for 11 years, 12 years, called the Women's Institute in Summer Enrichment. This was largely for women faculty, early career women faculty, but all levels were appropriate to talk about uh, curriculum development and also in terms of career development in uh, cybersecurity, broadly in cybersecurity. And uh, Teresa, I should say that uh, uh, your colleague at El Paso, Ann Gates, was really hugely, uh, uh, he, he was a huge partner of ours in in Wise and especially in Wise. And, uh, so that's that was a real privilege. Then we had, of course, our REU uh, sort of trust REU version, which was uh, which I will talk about in the later slides. Let me just highlight the last, the, the second, the uh, second to the end is the joint program with the NSA on really getting high school students and middle school students, all levels actually of school. But the last one, which we launched with support both from NSF and the Baskin Foundation was this uh, middle, for middle school girls. You know, we, we were, there's lots of uh, literature in, the, in education which says too late to wait for high school. So we began this girls in engineering and Claire Tomlin really ran these, uh, we started off with a cohort of middle school, you know, really uh, fifth, sixth, seventh grade, sixth and seventh grade primarily, maybe some eighth graders also to to really get them acculturated with uh, cyber physical systems and robots and so on and so forth. And, and these are some of the composite numbers, you know, the and, and the, the level of participation, you know, there are, as you may know, in computer science and especially in, in CE, you know, the Toby surveys don't paint a very rosy picture of the participation. So what might seem like modest numbers to you were actually a pretty large increases beyond this. Uh, Teresa, you have come on, so perhaps I should stop. But let, let me just say, put a plug for, you know, in 10 years, you can build partnerships that last a lifetime. And this Sedicia, which we did with San Jose State and Berkeley Stanford, it was really about, uh, Sedicia stands for Curriculum Development for Security Education. Over a period of these 10 years, you know, we reached out to teaching the teachers. There's 61 universities, 75% of them were HSIs, MSIs. You know, we gave professors uh, from these community colleges and other institutions who didn't have a summer salary, some summer salary to participate. And that had huge dividends. And this is a picture of one of the cohorts that went into this. Okay, uh, there's a little bit more in terms of, uh, you know, about the kinds of internships. You know, we wanted to get it all to 50 states, but we got to 36 states. But Puerto Rico was a huge partner. You know, the University of Puerto Rico and Mayaguez was especially just a wonderful, wonderful outreach partner for us in, uh, in terms of uh, participation in undergraduate programs. And, uh, you know, I, I remember when I was listening to the, okay, uh, let me not to dwell on this. The last slide that I want to use is the fact that, you know, this began with and, uh, you know, the SDCs were 4 million a year for 10 years. The match requirement was 10 million for the universities. But if you added up the money from the industry, from the philanthropic organizations, the international agencies, you know, it was really quite substantive. And over this period of 12 years, I think it really was a really substantive multiplier. So thank you very much, Teresa. And I hope I'm just a minute over time.